What is up, it's your boy Johnny Shreve, aka Mr. Telic. It is. I'm here with a special guest. We have the scientific snitch, Ella, on the channel today, and we are going to talk about training methodologies, nutrition, sanitation, all things that you might have some questions about or want some myth busting to happen. Either way, we're gonna get into it right away. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you channel. so much for having me. Yeah. So tell us about like give us give us a background because you know people need to know who you are why is this why is Ella on your channel what does she do and what does she know all right so i started off my whole educational undergrad career as a biology major but it was during covid so i ended up transferring to the university of michigan ann arbor i am a clinical kinesiologist go blue oh yeah go blue <laughs> Yeah. I'm a clinical kinesiology major, applied exercise science, and I'm currently helping to manage a cardiology lab, and I work in a bioenergetics lab in the kinesiology school. So that's okay. why. Okay, so just because, um, just just because you know, people might not really know, like, what is your what is your degree like? What is your in in the long run? Break down what your profession actually is. So for people that are watching, they have understand it because when you tell somebody. I'm doing applied science and exercise physio. It's like, what? Like, are you a personal trainer or something? Like, what is what is it? Like, break it down for us to get an understanding of what it actually is. Yeah, of course. So at the University of Michigan, we do a very heavy focus on the actual science. So we've got biomechanics, uh, musculoskeletal anatomy courses using plastinated models, like very in-depth understanding of how the human body moves and how the human body works. There's a very heavy emphasis on learning how to read the literature in almost every class. You're told to basically do a literature deep dive and learn everything you need to know about that class based on the actual scientific literature, which I really do appreciate. And doing all of those deep dives ended up getting me really into working in a lab, being in like the actual research space where I'm like working with pipettes and like in the lab code and all that stuff. So it's a... Uh, Right now I've been coaching on the side and that's pretty much what I do. It's a lot of just very analytical sort of reading into exactly what is going on in the body, not just like I heard it from a blog. So you're so you know what's like, you know, like that the the re how muscles is built, you know, how, how contractions have like how you get a uh you know, basically like what happens when you get a pump. You know exactly what that is not just like i got a lactic acid in my arm and then so you know the depth of that the reasons why those have the mechanisms oh. yeah there's there's such a huge emphasis on mechanisms like i think i've learned what a sarcomere is about 16 billion times okay so what is a sarcomere i'm gonna be i'm gonna be dumb because like remember i'm gonna ask the couple questions i'm gonna ask that are like that are gonna be pretty like you know relatable for those watching but what is a sarcomere because we're gonna because we're gonna learn today too so so at the end of this you're gonna feel so much smarter um about training and just fitness so explain what a sarcomere is so a sarcomere is the basic functional unit of a muscle. And if you want to think of it, it's kind of like a chain. It's like inside of your arm. And if you think of a chain, it, there's like these little connective, you've got the connective lengths. Now, when you pull on those connective lengths, they stretch, but you can also like kind of crunch them together, right? And that's kind of what a sarcomere is, except instead of just pulling and crunching them together, they can do that on their own. So. That's the basic idea of how your muscles work on the very, very smallest scale. And just FYI, you cannot see um, a sarcomere just like with your plain eye. That's impossible, but it is a reason why your muscles look like they're striated where they have the lines. Cool. All right, cool. So you, so would you consider yourself evidence-based trainer, coach? Yes. Or you're you're in the evidence based realm of like you know for myself I'm just a I'd be a bro with a you know certification with experience then you have like those who have you know uh, I'm a bro with an IFBB pro card and, and all stuff either way but you are evidence based and so yes yes I would consider myself evidence based um, especially consider but I try to emphasize both mechanism and outcome because I feel like both have their pros and cons and they're both important for our understanding okay so explain uh, mechanism and outcomes so outcome solely focuses on 
let's say your human randomized control data in like a cohort of 21 men, like that's the sort of outcome data that you're looking at. Like, did these people grow based off of these MRIs taken before and after this one training period? While that does give us a good idea of how things can translate into humans, it doesn't give us a good idea of how they translate over the course of a training lifetime because you can't follow somebody along for like 10 years. It's just not possible. But mechanisms, they give us an idea of what's going on underneath. So like, how does a muscle contract? Like what actually goes on to make that muscle contract? And based off of what we know, it's like motor neurons um, or like part of your brain basically signaling to your muscle. It depolarizes, which is a fancy term for saying it's an electrical signal that basically runs through your muscle, causing all of the... Um, causing calcium to be released from something called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is like, if you want to think about it, like a tank that sits on top of your contractile sarcomeres, so as before, and that calcium will bind to the sarcomere and basically force it to contract, and that's the basis of a muscle contraction. So the mechanism is that. Now, when you apply that sort of like the basic mechanisms, like how does muscle grow, how does muscle contract, along with outcome data, then you get a more clearer picture of what's actually happening and how you can apply that to training. Okay. So what, what would you consider, give me, well, give me your definition of, like, if you give it like the true definition of evidence-based, like, so for whoever's watching, it's like, like, you know, for, for me, it would be like, you know, what do you consider a bodybuilder? I consider a bodybuilder to be somebody who actively competes on stage, goes through the process, you know, has I went through his pro, you know, prep, you know, dieted down, went on stage, flexed, yada, yada, that's a bodybuilder. And then a professional bodybuilder is the one that does the same thing at the professional level. If you have not done that, you are someone who does the act of, you work out. You're not a bodybuilder, you work out. That's, you know, you're right. So that'll be my definition of what a bodybuilder is. What would your definition be if you want to nail it down of what is an evidence-based, what is evidence-based lifters or so you've got a few different classifications of evidence-based lifters you've got the people who have the qualification and the qualification is just saying that you contributed something to your field which allowed you to get a phd that's basically what a phd is you work for xyz amount of time you contribute some publications a thesis a nice long list of research that you did for that field. Granted, it di it differs from field to field. Like if you're in cardiology, it's like towards heart research. If it's in kinesiology, then it's towards exercise science. That's the qualification. So you've got qualified evidence-based people. You've got scientists who just work in a lab. They've got some research under their belt and they contribute, they're contributing. They're in the act of contributing. That's where I am. I. I qualify myself as a scientist. I'm not a PhD yet, but I do plan on working towards one. And then you've got just regular evidence-based, which is you look at the studies, you don't un you don't understand them fully. Maybe you look at the abstract, the conclusion, but let's be honest, you don't know what the difference is between a t-test and a ANOVA is. And that's like the I feel like that's that's a good tier list. And it's not to say that any one kind of evidence-based individual is incorrect or bad because everybody has their pros and cons. I'm of the belief that everybody knows something that you don't. And if you learn what that other person knows, then that makes you a better person. I would say from my experience, there's a lot more of the third online than there is of the first and second. So like Dr. Mike would be the first and second examples that you've given. And then, you know, those, then the third would be those who are, you know, influencers who, you know, have um, attractiveness or like they like the research part of it and they dive into that. And those are your evidence base, but there's no bad or nor good. It's just, there's going to be a different level of understanding for sure from the first group to the third. Yeah. And something can also be said, like people who do have a PhD, just because you do have a PhD doesn't mean you're up to date on current research. It doesn't mean that you're up to date on current methods. And it also doesn't necessarily mean that you know everything about everything. A lot of people over glorify PhDs, but in my head, people who aren't currently pursuing research as either a PhD or as a scientist are not on top of the current methods and are not going to fully understand them. When I first started getting into research, 
um, really understanding what RNA sequencing actually meant helped me understand and comprehend and critically think about the studies that I was reading, which is something that, like, you don't know unless you fully dive into the literature on that topic. Like, uh, there's two kinds of RNA sequencing, and I could probably get into this later, but it's just, like, knowing the difference between, like, microarray and Illumina sequencing can help you understand what is a better study to look at. Um, and it's that that sort of understanding and comprehension that I mean, like, when I say, like, one evidence-based individual probably knows something a little better about a certain field than another. Um, and that's that's what I mean. So how do you, how do you feel about evidence-based in the social media platform and its effect on the general public? I don't feel like there's enough curiosity. People are so obsessed with finding the one magic way and then they stick with it and they never want to change that it's harming our ability to progress. You make, okay, yeah. So I, so for me, for me, I like, so like speaking of people like yourself and I understand like I have a university degree, so I, I haven't studied as much as you have in terms of your field, but I definitely understand the amount of work that goes into under, knowing said field, depending on what it is. And also knowing that doesn't mean that because you've been there, you know everything either. For me, so I, I appreciate a lot of what science does bring to the table, obviously, when it comes to like, you know, fitness, right? Because for me, it's, you know, I'm a full-time coach and my goal is to be able to apply certain things to somebody's life so they can, I'm trying to get fitness to fit their life so they can live a healthier life and not just like, oh, I want to look good life, but like, I want you to be able to understand what you're doing with your own body and to be able to do this for the rest of your life. On the other hand, I find that science-based now, to me, seems like the new quick fix pill. It seems like the new shortcut to everything. When I look at what, especially on social media, like on looking at platforms, what's being said, and it seems to me that there is a definite answer for everything. Like, you know, it's almost like you're, when you're looking at, you know, how many times you should train a week, how many times you train a muscle group a week, parts of the contractions that are uh, heavily weighed more than others, you know, training to failure, etc. And it, that seems to me like if my general public hears you don't have to train to failure, okay, what are they going to do? Most people don't train that hard in any way, so that's just to say I don't have to train that hard, right? That could be translated that way. Uh, you know, the length and partial contraction or length of contraction is the most important part of the lift. It's like, okay, so now I don't have to actually do a full repetition type thing. So sometimes to me it seems like a lot of things from the evidence-based world are over analyzing and you know, over simplifying certain things and i find it is doing a lot more confusion like the uh, paralysis by analysis like i've had consults all week and i'm literally saying that word because that's all i've heard all week is paralysis by analysis i don't to do i just want to you know i just want to be strong and fit and I am over analyzing this and I get a paralysis by analysis and it's like, why is this? It's like, well, because this study said this and I was like, study, you're not, you're not even doing evidence to anything. So that's how I feel um, where evidence base kind of is as a whole right now, but it still has great, um, you know, purpose, obviously. It keeps us from doing some really dumb shit, but at the same time, it's like, I feel like it's kind of doing a little more, it's still a net positive, I feel like there's still a bit of a net negative there too as well. Yeah, it's very easy in science to to come to conclusions too quickly. And something that I've noticed is it's so important not to box humans into a box. We are we're we're a bunch of shades of gray. Like there is not one quick fix for everything. There's always going to be an exception. And that's like the one thing that I have to take like from all the science that I have learned it's so important to stay curious because the second you stop being curious is the second you stop learning. Something that like, this this could just be like something that really like rings true for like the length and partials at least, is like there's not one part of the lift that is most important. And I learned this very quickly when I was trying to prove length and partials wrong. There was one time in my like, when I was first diving into the literature and I was I had a really bad confirmation bias. I've learned how to kind of overcome that since then. But um, 
I, I would look up things and I would look it up as a full, complete sentence rather than just trying to look up the one topic that I was interested in. I've started doing it just by topic by topic and that helps me eliminate, like, instead of looking up length and partial or, I guess, stretch mediated hypertrophy doesn't work or stretch mediated hypertrophy is not good or whatnot in like PubMed or something. If I look up just stretch mediated hypertrophy, you get a whole different like set of results or you can look up like eccentric contractions or concentric contractions, but rather than just like, anyways, I found this one study and I could send it to you afterwards, but it looked at the transcription factors, which basically are the factors that affect whether you're growing, whether you're getting muscle damage and whatnot. They found that there was a pretty good like balance between the concentric and eccentric contraction for growth and damage like one or the other is not more important they both have something to contribute and you'll see this in some of the some new like there's some like stuff on the fringe of literature where it's like talking about how an electrical stimulus can contribute to hypertrophy which directly goes against the understanding that the stretch part of the movement is the only thing causing hypertrophy so you can't conflate one mechanism and say that that's the entirety because that that takes away your curiosity. Yeah. Okay. So it's good because since, since we're on that topic, because this is like something that you know I find I really want people to really just understand. And um, I'm gonna write down before I forget because I have ADD, and then I'll start rambling. Dude, same. <laughs> I think you already noticed me doing it a few times. I gotta write it down, man. <laughs> right. So when it comes like so, when when we're looking at evidence based stuff, and I want you to hear pick up evidence based, but even for myself, well, you know, I have a uh, certification, and um, I'm a, I'm a, I'm what they call it a, I'm a elite trainer because I have it all. I have the uh, strength conditioning and the training and nutrition all in one. I got the good package. I say I'm great. But when it comes when it comes down to it, when it comes to like applying things or trying to, you know, coach somebody. I find for myself like how much how much of what I know does the does my client need to know for them to be able to apply those things to their life to be able to live a healthier life, live an optimal life, and you know be strong, etc. And to myself, I'm like not much. Like it's when you look at it, like the most basic stuff is what and what I've been applying for years. Like I haven't done anything new or tricky to any of my clients. Maybe some different type of movements that are basically the same I've just you know find a different way to do a you know a row you know what I mean you know over the years of doing rows and be like hey I can you know I've been at gym since 11 years old so I can take a lot of things in the gym and make it into a row machine of some sort so you know I haven't changed anything at all but when it comes to the client like I realize like there is, like, as, like let's say out of the 100 percent of things that I know they really only need to know like I don't know like 10 percent like and you really can't give like an actual number. But how much do you feel like as, as much as you know, as like say like, you know, as you know, as much research that you know, how much does the general public have to know to be able to have a good enough understanding to apply, you know, proper training fundamentals to their life to be able to, you know, see results and live long and prosper in the realms of fitness? So the advice that I give is Train hard. Don't always train to be sore. Like, don't strive to be the way that, like, don't strive for soreness that makes you feel like you can't get up in the morning. So just train hard, but don't train until you're, like, dead. Eat a high-protein diet. Maintain a healthy body fat percentage. Sleep at least seven, eight hours at least. Drink enough water and maybe, like, try to limit saturated fat and cholesterol and added sugars, but it's not like you can still have them. It's like 80 yeah. 20 diet sort of thing. Yeah. It's not that deep. It's really not like you need to understand DNA and mRNA and all this other stuff. Like all of that is fun to know, but let, let's be honest here. Eating a high protein diet that's that focuses on like getting what you need, training hard and getting enough sleep is like pretty much the yeah. 